Next, we'll hear from Jane Thomason, certified industrial hygienist. Jane, when you're ready, go ahead. So as we've noted on Thursday, May 13th, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or CDC released new guidance saying that vaccinated individuals no longer needed to wear masks, avoid crowds or large gatherings, observe physical distancing, or get tested or isolate after an exposure unless they develop symptoms, with only a few exceptions. This newest CDC guidance does not protect public health and threatens the lives of patients, nurses, and other essential workers across the country. Public health guidance and decisions should be based on science and should protect everyone's health. The CDC's new guidance does neither. This morning, I will talk about both the science on COVID and how the CDC's new guidance is based on dangerous assumptions and incomplete data. This information is provided in more detail in NMU's new scientific brief available on our website. It is clear that COVID vaccines are very effective at preventing severe illness, hospitalization, and death from COVID. However, COVID vaccines are not a replacement for wearing masks, getting tested, contact tracing, or other public health measures that science has shown are effective at slowing and stopping the spread of COVID. And COVID vaccines are not a replacement for a strong, effective federal occupational health and safety standard protecting nurses and other workers, as was mandated by President Biden on January 21st, but which has still not been promulgated. Based on publicly available information, many of the studies cited by the CDC as informing the rationale for their guidance for vaccinated individuals were either not yet peer reviewed or conducted by people with a conflict of interest or by vaccine manufacturer itself or reported poor statistical certainty in the findings. In a new scientific brief provides an overview and critique of the body of evidence the CDC states they base their guidance on. The table on this slide summarizes the studies cited in CDC science brief titled Background Rationale and Evidence for Public Health Recommendations for Fully Vaccinated People. As of this morning, this, this CDC science brief was last updated April 2nd, 2021. You can see on this slide that each study cited by the CDC was either a preprint, not yet peer reviewed, or had a reported financial conflict of interest by authors except for one. The paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine listed on the last row of this table was conducted in Israel, which has had a different public health response to this pandemic, has a different national health care system, and higher rates of vaccination than the United States. This data from Israel can contribute to our understanding of vaccines, but should not be relied upon to remove protections. You'll also note in the far right-hand column of this table, the very wide 95% confidence intervals or measures of statistical uncertainty reported by several of these studies. The wider these confidence intervals are, the less certain the results. Even though reporting these confidence intervals is a general and expected practice because it helps other scientists understand how to view a study's results, the CDC failed to share these confidence intervals in their science brief. Additional studies have been published since the CDC last updated this brief explaining the rationale for guidance for vaccinated people. But these additional studies do not add sufficient information to roll back guidance at this point. For example, Dr. Walensky is widely citing a new report published in the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly report last Friday, the day after the CDC updated their guidance. This May 14th MMWR reported an interim analysis of a study of a small cohort of just under 2,000 healthcare workers at 33 sites across the U.S. The study reported a vaccine efficacy of 94% with a 95% confidence interval of 87 to 97% at preventing symptomatic COVID infections. This study provides no information on a vaccine prevention of asymptomatic infections. This May 14th MMWR also provides no information about testing programs at the 33 sites included in the study, except to say that these testing programs were possibly different at different sites. Were vaccinated workers tested less often than unvaccinated workers? Also, 
there was no information in this report provided about the personal protective equipment or infection control at facilities included in the study. So while controls who did not get COVID were matched to COVID cases by site, we don't know from this MMWR whether COVID cases were clustered at particular sites or due to multiple infection prevention measures in addition, or whether prevention was due to multiple infection prevention measures in addition to the vaccines. It is also worth noting that this MMWR published on May 14th analyzed data from January to March 2021. Since March, the proportion of sequences in the United States identified from variants of concern has dramatically increased. For example, the proportion of samples due to the B1526 variant originally identified in New York last October uh, has more than doubled since March. Uh, this variant uh, may be, uh, uh, sorry, vaccines may be less effective at neutralizing the B1526 variant. In addition to the issues I have just discussed, the new CDC guidance also makes several dangerous and inaccurate assumptions about COVID and the COVID vaccines. The new CDC guidance dangerously assumes that mild and asymptomatic COVID cases are not a big deal and not worth preventing. But we know that these mild and asymptomatic cases are a big part of how the virus spreads and can lead to long-term debilitating health impacts. A large study from the Veterans Health Administration found that individuals who had COVID and were not hospitalized reported excess negative health impacts impacting most major organ and regulatory systems at least six months after infection. The CDC's new guidance also dangerously assumes that it is okay for a proportion of vaccinated people to become infected, to be hospitalized, and to die from COVID. No vaccine is 100% effective. There are breakthrough infections and deaths among people who have been fully vaccinated. Additionally, the CDC announced earlier this month that they will no longer track breakthrough infections, infections that occur in fully vaccinated individuals, unless they result in hospitalization or death. That means that the CDC is not tracking the data needed to understand whether these new guidelines on masking and testing for vaccinated people hold true. And there are important questions about vaccines that remain unanswered. We don't know how long protection will last. We don't know how effective vaccines are at preventing asymptomatic and mild infections, which are important to prevent because they can cause long-term health impacts or long COVID and may transmit the virus. It is also not clear how well vaccines will protect from variants of concern that are more transmissible, deadlier, and already are or may become resistant to vaccines. Scientists have voiced concerns about how increasing exposures via relaxing guidance while only a small proportion of the population is vaccinated, may create selective evolutionary pressure on the virus that may favor spread or emergence of variants that are able to infect people who have been immunized. Vaccines are one important public health tool to combat this pandemic, and we encourage everyone to get vaccinated. But by themselves, vaccines are not enough. Scientific evidence underlines the importance of implementing multiple measures to slow and stop the spread of COVID. Fundamental to selecting effective public health measures is understanding how the virus spreads. Since the beginning of the pandemic, scientists have learned important information about how the virus that causes COVID spreads. The virus spreads primarily via aerosol transmission. When an infected person breathes, speaks, coughs, or sneezes, they release aerosol particles that can contain infectious virus. These aerosol particles, which are mostly microscopic, can travel long distances through and stay suspended in the air. When someone inhales these particles, they can become infected. We have also learned that the virus can be transmitted by people who are infected but have no symptoms, what we call asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission. Studies indicate that approximately half of all COVID transmission events are from cases that have no symptoms. What this science means is that multiple public health measures are needed to stop and slow transmission of COVID. The Swiss cheese model of risk reduction is a good way to think about this. Think about each prevention measure like a slice of Swiss cheese. 
Each slice of Swiss cheese has holes in it, but the holes are in different places. Measures to prevent and slow virus transmission are similar to these slices of Swiss cheese. They're solid in some places, but have holes in other places. If you line up enough slices of cheese in a row or put in place enough prevention measures together, the virus cannot go through, cannot be transmitted. Several studies have shown that a combination of measures is effective at preventing and controlling the transmission of COVID. For example, a study from New South Wales, Australia found that a multifaceted strategy combining testing, contact tracing, mass usage, and distancing protocols was a robust means of controlling COVID transmission. It is worth noting that New South Wales has reported just 5,371 COVID infections since the beginning of the pandemic through May 16, 2021. That is 0.068% of their population. Compare this to the United States where more than 32 million infections or nearly 10% of our population have been reported. This study and others are summarized in any new scientific brief. Our scientific brief also summarizes evidence for specific prevention measures, such as wearing masks. Um, wearing masks helps reduce the aerosol particles the mask wearer emits. If one person wears a mask, it isn't going to be very helpful. If everyone wears a mask, there's more protection. If everyone wears a mask and keeps their distance and stays outside or in a well-ventilated place, there's even more protection. Thinking about the role that asymptomatic transmission plays in how quickly this virus spreads, it's important to wear masks, keep distant, preference outdoor areas all the time, because many people who are infectious do not yet know they are infected. Several studies have documented the effectiveness of masks in combination with other measures. And it's important to recognize that the new CDC guidance undermines and removes these layers of protection. The high rate of transmission from asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic cases also means that testing, contact tracing, and isolation of cases and contacts are necessary measures to identify cases and prevent further transmission. Studies have shown that testing strategies based only on the presence of symptoms fail to detect all or most COVID cases. The CDC's new guidance undermines these layers of protection. Protecting nurses and other essential workers remains an important part of combating the COVID pandemic. Nurses and other essential workers have been placed at great risk of COVID exposure and infection during the pandemic because their employers have not put in place the necessary workplace protections. We have seen local transmission explode after outbreaks in workplaces. For example, a May 2020 analysis found that counties with meatpacking plants, which have notoriously failed to protect their employees from COVID, had doubled, the cases per, had doubled the cases per capita compared to the average county. One study found that healthcare workers in the US and the UK were more than 11 times more likely to report a positive COVID test than the general public. It is worth noting that nurses and other healthcare workers have long had difficulty accessing COVID testing, even when exposed at work or experiencing symptoms. The CDC and the federal government have failed to track infections, hospitalizations, and deaths among healthcare workers and other essential workers. The CDC's May 13th update on the guidance for vaccinated individuals only increases essential workers' exposure to the virus while also further inhibiting their ability to get tested. It is clear that employers have failed to provide the necessary protections from COVID and an emergency temporary standard on COVID from the US Occupational Safety and Health Administration or OSHA is an important part of controlling and stopping the spread of this virus. And of course, um, vaccines are an important uh, prevention measure when used in combination with other measures. In this um, conversation, it is important to acknowledge the reality of our current situation. Cases are lower than they were during the winter surge, but we are still seeing tens of thousands of new cases reported each day. Nearly 600 people in the US are still dying each day from COVID. 90% of counties have moderate, substantial, or high transmission, according to the CDC. 24% of new cases reported in just the last week are among children. Variants of concern that are more transmissible, deadlier, and are or may become resistant to vaccines continue to emerge and continue to spread. Additionally, it is important to view the CDC's May 13th update 
in the context of decreased diagnostic testing overall and the lack of genomic surveillance in the United States. The past four months has seen a decline in weekly testing of 33%. Genomic surveillance or the sequencing of viruses to identify the variant responsible for the infection is lagging severely in the United, in the United States. The decline in testing plus inadequate genomic surveillance creates blind spots, which inhibit our ability to identify outbreaks and the spread of variants. It is also important to recognize that only 37.5% of the U.S. population have been vaccinated. Children under 12 cannot get vaccinated right now. We do not know whether or how much vaccines protect people who are immunocompromised, such as transplant recipients or people living with HIV or cancer. We do not yet know how long protection from vaccines will last. We do not know how well the vaccines may protect from variants of concern. In these situations, it is important to remember the precautionary principle that protecting people's health need not await scientific certainty that there is harm. And so given what we know and what is still unknown, we must take the science-driven safety-first route to protect public health by maintaining multiple measures of infection control, including masking and distancing and testing, while at the same time working harder to increase vaccination rates. Now is not the time to roll back protective measures. Thank you.